All right, hi uh, everyone. Um, I gather we don't have a PA system. I'm just speaking in there for the camera. If you can't hear me, please shout in the back. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to talk about GStreamer. Um, catchy title. It's going to be super high level. If you're hoping for any in-depth information about GStreamer, you're not going to find it here. But you can catch me in the hallway later, and we can talk about anything. Um, right. I'm Tim. That's Sebastian. And well, first of all, who are we? Um, we're long-time GStreamer developers. We've been hacking on it for um, 10 years, roughly. Um, we work for Centricular, which is a new little startup consultancy, um, and we do consulting around GStreamer, multimedia, and graphics stuff. So what are we going to talk about? First of all, quick intro to GStreamer. Um, what is that thing? Um, secondly, the biggest part, we're just going to, as I said, very high level, just mention different things people are doing with GStreamer. Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk about a little bit about sort of what's coming up, what are people working on, um, what features do we expect to land soon, maybe what's missing as well. Um, right, so GStreamer, what is it? Um, it's a multimedia framework. It's pipeline based. Um, that means there's a concept of a flow. You know, something produces a certain types of media, um, and then you have a pipeline, and you have building blocks, and you put them all together, and then somehow the media flows from one uh, to the next. And all these building blocks have different functions. So you might have something that you know outputs stuff to the screen, or it writes it to a file, or it um, you know scales it, or transforms it, or applies a little funny hat effect, or whatever. All these things, and it's very much like Lego. You know, you just have all these different pieces. You can put them together, and then you just say go, and it does stuff. Um, <coughs> so basically, what it provides is it's all very it's all plugin based. So you can write your own plugins. Um, there are hundreds of different plugins. Um, and, uh, but GStreamer itself is a library, so you can use it in your application like everything else. So you, you, know, you use all these plugins you, you, as Lego pieces, you build your, your Lego thing, and then you just, um, just uh, set it to play. And we try to be super generic, so we, we, we build on other people's work. Like for codecs on the uh, Linux desktop, for example, we would use libav or fmpeg. We, um, we wrap other people's libraries and other people's multimedia work. So it's not like we reinvent everything from scratch, but um, we just provide the framework and let the hard um, work leave that to other people. <coughs> it's open source, um, LGPL2, which means you can write proprietary applications on top of it. You don't have to publish your code. You can write proprietary plugins and keep them to yourself. Um, although, you know, making them open source is always nicer, but, you know, sometimes you can't. So that's proprietary stuff, perfectly fine. Uh, it's cross-platform, Linux, embedded Linux, Android, iOS, Windows, OS X, um, you name it, we've got it. And we've got binaries for it as well. Um, it's, a very, it's a stable API. We um, guarantee backward compatibility. Um, and we have you, you don't have to write everything in C if you don't want to. We provide bindings for high-level languages, Python, JavaScript, whatnot. Um, just to make that point clear, things GStreamer is not. It's not a. It's not a, a server of any kind. It's not a media player. It's not a, um, a transcoding tool. It's not a. You know, it's not a codec or a protocol library. You can you can use GStreamer to do all of these things, um, but it's just a library for you to do anything multimedia um, related. And <coughs> our goals is, are we want to be super flexible. Um, like, we want to integrate with everything and everyone. Um, both of, um, you know, we should be able to, you should be able to use more or less anything in, uh, you know, as a plugin in GStreamer. But likewise, you should be able to, to use GStreamer in anything you do, whether it's a web browser, whether it's, um, you know, a server application you're writing, um, whether it's a little um, handheld device thingy you're writing, whatever, it should you know it should work everywhere. We shouldn't say okay, but only if you use that toolkit and that. You know, we try to work everywhere. Um, we have a super large um, active developer community. I think we've got a great community. So whenever you have a problem, chances are there are loads of people who've run into it already, which is great. Um, and we ha also have a large commercial ecosystem. There are loads of companies building products on top of GStreamer. Um, and even more importantly, that these companies, not, they don't just take the stuff and go away and do their thing, but many of them actually, I mean, there are loads of those as well, of course, but many of them, they actually contribute back. So you've got um, companies which contribute fixes and um, 
code all the time, which is great. And of course, you've got consultancies as well, not just one, multiple ones. That's always good to have if you're, if you're building stuff. All right, mm -hmm. um, over to Sebastian. Okay, um, hello. So let's start with the uh, uh, well, stuff people are doing with GStreamer. First, let's start with the boring things. Like um, it's used in desktop environments and desktop applications. If you use Linux, you probably use it somewhere. It's used by GNOME, Enlightenment, XFC, KDE. Uh, used for media player, screen capturing, camera usage, all the stuff. It's used uh, by Qt, by the Qt Multimedia um, subsystem. It's used by the OpenJDK. It's used by LibreOffice, OpenOffice. So whatever you have on your desktop, you will probably use it, at least on Linux. And um, well, this kind of stuff was where GStreamer found its first large scale usage. But as said, that's boring. Let's go to the more interesting things. So let's go to the web. Um, it's used in WebKit in uh, four different ports at least, uh, in the GTK and the EFL, in the Qt and in the Windows Cairo ports. And there it's used um, for all the HTML5 uh, media stuff. It's used um, for media source extension. It's used for web audio for everything basically. It's um, also used in Firefox. Not that much there, um, and they're just using it uh, as a codec library. I think uh, by default on Linux, and um, you can compile it uh, on OS X and Windows, but it's not the default. And then since a few days, uh, there's a Blink extension, a Chrome extension, uh, where you can then just use GStreamer to do all the stuff, uh, all the media stuff in the browser instead of whatever Google is providing you. And then there's a uh, um, new well, WebRTC client-side implement implementation since uh, last year October called OpenWebRTC, which is also just wrapping around GStreamer. And well, it's a very little code base. I think it's something like 10,000 lines of code. And all the heavy work is done by GStreamer. Um, uh, well, th what they provide is sample applications for Linux, Android, iOS, and OS X. Currently, it's work in progress, and uh, soonish um, there is in, uh, integration into WebKit planned. Then, on the server side, of course, we also have quite a few applications there. Um, most important, let's say, uh, Corento currently, which is a WebRTC HTML5 streaming server thing. It's huge, it's very enterprisey, and you can basically do everything with it. Uh, but we also have smaller things like uh, all kinds of little streaming transcoding servers that are built on GStreamer. We have our own RTSP server implementation. We have stuff for Dash and HLS. You can even buy some commercial hardware boxes where you plug in some inputs and it's just encoding stuff and sending it to the network. Then uh, what we also have is a DLNA server implementation called Rigel, which exists since quite a few years already, works quite well. And it's using GStreamer for um, example for um, yeah, transcoding on the fly. If your um, device can't handle a specific codec, well, it's just transcoding on the fly. You don't notice anything, just plays afterwards. Yeah, um, then to a few more interesting things. Uh, it's used in video editing applications. So what you see here is, well, standard nonlinear video editor interface. This is a PTV, open source application, and uh, it's using GStreamer for all the media handling, for the editing, for the encoding, for reading of files, for effects. And um, well, there's um, currently a fundraiser still running if you want to donate some money on it so it becomes even better. And in the end, it's um, all the work that is done on PTV is also helping GStreamer in general. And PTV is based on the um, GStima editing services library, which, well, is, as I said, used in PTV, but it's also used in uh, quite a few commercial products nowadays. So there's, for example, this one here. It's uh, an application where you can, um, uh, well, you have uh, recordings uh, for a movie uh, from different angles, etc., and you can um, just align them properly, then select oh, I want to have uh, this part uh, for the first 10 seconds, then from this angle, the other seconds, <laughs> and it allows you to well, combine all the, uh, this movie. Then it's used in music compositing and audio editing applications. So one of them is uh, bus tracks, and it allows you to put together various instruments uh, graphically, and then you can define control curves for all kinds of properties on them, and then let that thing run. So. Maybe a picture says a bit more. Basically, you have all kinds of uh, well, 
virtual electronic instruments like oscillators, all kinds of filters, and then you can just plug things together and make cool electronic music. Right, um, that's one thing people use GStreamer for quite a bit. It comes up in loads of different scenarios, which is multi-device uh, synchronization. Um, we, you, you will notice, we'll, we'll mention it multiple times. Um, <coughs> one of them is, for example, you've got a cl classroom thing, you know, like everyone has tablets, the teacher has a tablet or a computer, and you want to stream um, that to all your students, and the students should sort of be able to follow what the, um, what the teacher does, or likewise. Um, you will think, okay, you know, a picture, 50 tablets, a solved problem, you know, just use multicast or whatever. Um, it's in theory quite simple, but in practice it's, it's a little bit tricky <coughs> because you've got um, Wi-Fi, so, you know, Wi-Fi, you can't use multicast in practice. Um, you, you deal with random um, access points and infrastructure that you don't control the hardware of. So it's quite challenging. You've got uh, bandwidth is very limited. You've got all these different devices. It has to work with all these different versions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's quite tricky to do in, in, in practice. That's what it looks like, um, you know, uh, 50 or whatever, 30, I don't know, haven't counted, tablets. Um, that's what it looked like before, and later they're all in sync. And I can't show you the, the video now, but um, if, you, if you look at the video, it's quite nice. You know, the teacher goes like, <laughs> does stuff on the tablet, and you can see how it, with, with very low latency, sort of updates on the, on the other bits. Um, that's for you. Yeah, then what's uh, relatively new is uh, that GStreamer is used in quite a few commercial ingest or playout servers. Um, basically what there the goal is you have uh, all kinds of inputs. You um, want to record them live. You want to rebroadcast broadcast them. You want to mix them together. And um, in all that, it's very important that you have some fixed defined latency and things just shouldn't fall apart. And especially it, uh, um, everything has to run reliable for 24 hours, seven days a week. They are is no, it just must not fail. And um, well, there are a few applications that are doing this or stuff uh, like scheduling of recorded shows, uh, overlaying things, putting subtitles in there or some kind of news sticker. Uh, some of them are using uh, the GPU for all this fancy uh, mixing stuff. And um, what is also important here in this context is, um, well, we have good support for SDI input and output for um, 4K, 8K, 10-bit, 12-bit uh, video, it's all there. Currently best supported uh, would be um, the Blackmagic Decklink cards, but also we support quite a few others. And well, that's how you could uh, um, visualize that kind of thing. This kind of software um, could run GStreamer. Our example here doesn't, but others do. Then, yeah. Just to go back to the, to the server stuff, um, the, the, the problem in GStreamer is always you have these pipelines and you put stuff together and then data, you know, buffers, video, audio starts to flow. And our problem has always been that, well, you know, if, if, if there's no data flow somewhere, then the whole pipeline sort of gets jammed. So um, it's, it's quite, re quite recently we now have lots of video mixers and audio mixers which work very well with live input, which is something you need in that scenario. Um, that's where the defined latency comes from. So that's um, in Git currently. That's quite nice. Um, of course, GStreamer is used on set-up boxes. There are different kinds of boxes. Um, uh, some, some are just IPTV type things, you know, in hospitals. May they just stream different t uh, TV channels over multicast or unicast um, over IP. Um, some are personal video recorders, of course, um, live uh, TV, DVB. Um, there's catch-up video, um, iPlayer and stuff like that, and also video on demand. Video on demand is basically, well, it might be full pay or it might not be full pay. Uh, it could be encrypted or not. Um, those usually use quite low-cost uh, chips, which makes it sometimes a bit challenging. Um, <coughs> and there, there are loads of people who do um, set-top boxes using that. Um, UView is one of them, which is like a BBC, um, not subsidiary, but company. Uh, Dreambox, um, make Dream Hardware. Um, there's a French uh, company which uses them. You know how what a set-top box looks like. That's what it does. Um, it's the same for TVs. It's actually used quite widely in t TVs. I think all the major uh, TV manufacturers um, use GStreamer somewhere these days. Um, LG does uh, stuff in with WebOS. Uh, Samsung has announced Tizen uh, TVs now, which also includes GStreamer. Um, that's quite cool. And I think GStreamer is mostly used in, in those cases for the connectivity part, which um, is basically DL DLNA playback, playback of stuff from an external hard drive. Um, the, the on-demand video, all these smart TV features, um, you know, 
like uh, Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that, possibly. Yeah, so but it's also for recording and yeah, time sure. shifting. Oh, time shifting. That's what a TV looks like. Um, <laughs> you might have seen one before. Um, and of course, then you've got all these uh, integrated entertainment systems, um, which is air airplanes, cars, etc. Um, In-flight entertainment, in-vehicle entertainment. Um, again, you have uh, video on demand. You know, if you're in a plane, of course, you just choose um, what to play. In a car, you might want to share your screen between different users, um, and your network connection is limited, so you, you know you can't play the same clip three times and download it. But you have to download it once and share it out and things like that. Um, and again, synchronized multi-device playback. You know, you you have a security announcement and blah 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 in your you know the, at the beginning of the flight um, in your plane, and you want it to to be played on all 180 seats in, in sync. Apparently, it's quite challenging. Um, I don't know. I have been on a new plane recently, and um, the, the sync was out for five seconds. It's amazing. Um, Boeing 777. Yeah. Um, it's also used in little planes like that, um, like I don't know, Challenger plane or Learjet or something, business planes or the entertainment system there um, uses GStreamer. Do that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, then it's also used uh, for video walls or distri distributed speaker systems. And in those cases, it's always important that you have, well, for the video frame accurate synchronization between all the different devices. For audio, well, you need even more accurate synchronization and, uh, well, we can do that over the network. And um, there's also a, a little, well, uh, <coughs> example demo application called Arena that you could use to set this up in your own network and just play around with it. <coughs> if you look at the code, it's uh, really small and it's uh, allowing you to um, well show the same video or audio on a lot of different devices uh, and it's completely synchronized um, there's also an uh, Android application using that so you could even use it on your phone or your tablet and um, there are also uh, well, quite a few commercial products used for uh, control rooms or well, command rooms for video walls for digital signage and well also for this kind of huge control room things. <coughs> it's quite amazing what people are actually doing. Drones, yes. Um, well, most of them, you know, we'll, you watch Homeland, it's all uh, military and espionage use, but actually increasingly people are using drones for all kinds of uh, civil use cases. Um, and they're doing stuff with GStream on them. I mean, so the rescue and emergency stuff, it's both sort of, um, I don't know, well, you could deliver medical aid, uh, for example, or you're an ex disaster relief, um, you know, remote areas which you can't easily access. Um, it's used apparently for law enforcement, I've been told, in the US, you know, long uh, roads in the middle of nowhere where they uh, enforce a speed limit using that. Um, packet delivery, we have to see. Yeah, and um, also it's quite interesting. It's um, used in a few places, uh, in remote places, uh, to, um, <coughs> well, op to make sure that no um, fire is happening there or no other disasters. So if you have a huge jungle or a huge, um, um, how do you call it? Right. Augmented reality, yeah. So um, this is a demo. I don't know, it's very hard to see. But so you've got a guy here, and there, you know, one of these um, Oculus Rift um, kind of things. Um, so it's uh, basically, you know, you, you get to see stereo um, video. You've got a stereo impression. And the camera is on the little digger. It's like a, a, a digger, sort of an excavator. And the, the idea is that the guy with the glasses sort of remote controls the excavator. Um, and of course, that needs to be very low latency. It actually um, uses WebRTC in this case. Um, so that's quite nice. Well, we don't have that much time anymore, so I will skip a bit. Uh, but well, it's so I, I'll just uh, say a little bit uh, about these things. It's used in uh, all kinds of home security systems for security cameras, for well, motion, motion detection. You just want to start recording once uh, something is moving. It's used for well, streaming these things, so you can well observe your home f uh, when you're in your holidays and, and stuff like that. Then uh, it's used actually quite a lot for all kind of IP conferencing and communication and in those cases very important, absolutely low latency, you won't ha um, have all this kind of stuff work with uh, lots of participants and um, there are a few commercial products that are doing that at a very huge scale and things like WebRTC or SIP are of course used in these cases and perfectly supported. 
Um, then what's also quite nice is uh, it's used uh, for event recording and broadcasting. So for example, there's an uh, open source application called Tim Videos, <coughs> not related to this Tim. Uh, and it was used uh, last year at LCA for recording all the presentations and streaming them. But there's also a um, commercial company called Ubicast, which is providing services to well, record all kinds of events and stream them. And they are also using GStreamer w inside a proprietary application. Um, then it's also used for media management and publishing. There's the Media Goblin open source project, for example. Basically what it allows you to do, deploy your own YouTube, Flickr or SoundCloud kind of thing. It is or was, we're not act uh, completely sure, uh, used by Ardu, which is some kind of Spotify-like <laughs> service in the US. And they were or are using it in the backend for streaming. And oh. then, of course, it's used uh, in lots of mobile and embedded devices. Uh, as said before, it's used for iOS apps, for Android apps. But um, there are also actually some dev Android devices that included in the system, for example, the Samsung Galaxy X cover. So if you have that one, it's using GStreamer inside. You might not know. And uh, well, it's part of lots of uh, embedded Linux SDKs. Um, you will notice it. Then, quite fancy thing, um, it's used for gravitational wave research um, for the LIGO project, which is, uh, which is for Laser Inferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I have no idea what that does uh, exactly, but what they are trying to do is um, they are trying to detect gravitational waves from collisions or um, of neutron stars or rotating neutron stars. It's quite fancy stuff. And uh, they have large scale signal processing pipelines using GStreamer with thousands of filters and they need perfect synchronization. If after 30 hours there's a, off, uh, a drift of one sample, they will complain and they fix quite a few bugs like this already. And large parts of this are free software. Right, and uh, we had a guy who actually, well, I think it's just a little Android app, but he, uh, he used GStreamer to put stuff on the International Space Station, little application for astronauts, apparently, to help them uh, with different procedures on the smartphone, which is scheduled to go up. I don't know if it's up yet. Um, quick, the future, we don't have much time. Um, what are we working on? What are we hoping to improve in the near future? Development tools, it's been our, one of our weak spots. Um, there's a new tracing subsystem in Bugzilla. Uh, we still have to review it. Um, based on that, we hope that we'll be able to develop better tools for debugging stuff <coughs> and tracing stuff and performance optimization. Um, continuous integrations, builds for all um, operating systems is, uh, exist already. We want to uh, create binaries automatically. Um, testing, a lot of testing and QA stuff is going on. GSD Validate is a new suit uh, which is proving to be increasingly useful. GSD Harness is a new um, API to create um, unit tests. On the feature front, sorry? You missed one important point, the convenience APIs, uh, because that's also what people are often complaining about, that it's so difficult to write a player, and for example, and we uh, now provide more easy APIs to, well, you can write a playback application in 10 lines of C code. I apologize. Um, features, trick modes. Trick modes is a big area. There are lots of different types of trick modes. Um, the adaptive streaming, streaming type trick mode is uh, sort of very important to many um, people, so that's being worked on, but also for local file playback. Um, stereoscopic 3D support, hopefully going to land soon. Editing support is, is being improved. Um, Dash HLS, um, both the serving side and the client side. Um, are being improved. Uh, Cross-platform support, the other platforms, um, we're trying to get them up to, I mean, you know, that, that all platforms should be the same level of quality, make sure the plugins work great, hardware acceleration should work, you know, on iOS and Android, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Anything else? We might have time for one single question. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> It seems uh, maybe GStreamer is just not doing coffee. That's the only <laughs> thing <laughs> it's not doing. But so it can. It can. It course, yeah. it <laughs> could. So we have time for one question. Yeah. You, you, you want, want to ask a question? Yes, yeah. maybe. Um, so you've mentioned that you're working on uh, better debugging tools. It's not really a development tool, but debugging tools. But um, if this is C, then why not just debug with, you know, compile with debug information and use GPT or Core Dumps? I mean, what are your plans? What are you? 
Well, I mean, those are sort of the easy things to debug. Uh, sorry, the question was, why don't we, if we, I was talking about better debugging tools, why don't we use just, you know, GDB and the um, Novell grind and all the usual tools for debugging? Um, yeah, I should probably have made that clear. The kind of debugging tools we're looking for are completely different from those kind of code debugging tools. Um, if you have complex pipelines, you want to know, um, you know, why does that take so much time? Um, you know, do we read, do we do stuff efficiently, inefficiently? Mm -hmm. How long does it take for a buffer to go from there to there? What's the latency of, of certain things? Stuff like that. And um, that's very, very hard to track down currently because you've got these huge complex pipeline interactions. Um, yes, so, you so that's plan a on making such a framework that will allow you to do that with Yeah, so you can sort of you, you can set up hooks and you can sort of drill down to a specific part of the pipeline and, and sort of you know find out exactly what's going on. Currently we have a debug log, so you can set the G GSD debug level to like six and then you get uh, five gigabytes of logs. That's great. You can <laughs> find lots of information in there. But that's not very, um, you know, if on an embedded system, that's not going to be fun. It's not fun to read these logs, so it's more like a, um, <laughs> a structured way so, you know, the computer can dynamically do stuff. Right. Um, yeah, we, we don't know where we're going with that, but, you know, people want better debugging tools. And just actually l seeing what your pipeline looks like, you can do that now, you can sort of dump a, a screenshot, but, um, you know, it's, it's not dynamic, doing that dynamically would be nice. That All right. And tools like GDB also have the problem where GSMR is completely multi-threaded and if you have a huge pipeline, you can easily have hundreds of threads. Right. Looking at that in GDB is going to be a, a disaster. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, find us outside.